Hey there, everybody. Two words before we get started. First, from our friends at Chalice Press. They have a book called Craddock on the Craft of Preaching. Some argue that no one has had more impact and influence on the craft in the last couple of decades than Fred Craddock. This book gathers the best of the best of Craddock's latest lectures and workshops. Check it out at chalicepress.com or wherever fine books are sold. Also, clarify your focus, sharpen your skills, and intensify your ministry with a Doctor of Ministry degree from Virginia Theological Seminary. As the largest Episcopal seminary in the U.S., VTS offers an unparalleled, flexible demon program that will introduce you to the latest in congregational development and educational research. Check them out at vts.edu or on Facebook. Okay, here's your program. Hey everybody, I'm Chris Yaw. Welcome to Church Next. It's a place where people who are passionate about building healthy congregations come to hear from the very best mentors around. And today, we are joined by a one-time pastor, an author, and now a seminary professor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. He's uh, David Los. Uh, perhaps you've read one of his books or his blog posts at workingpreacher.org. If you haven't been there, you, you need to go. It's wonderful where he informs there, he challenges, he encourages preachers from all traditions in the important work that they do. And so, David, welcome uh, to Church Next. And let's begin right right there. Why don't you begin telling us about some of the, um, well, why don't we begin with some of the bright spots? What are some of the, the, um, the invigorating, energetic things that you're seeing um, going on in the church today? One of the things that most impresses me when I'm able to be out and about with uh, pastors and church leaders is the tremendous energy they bring to their calling and uh, an excitement for the church, not just the church at large, but their local congregations. And I think um, in some respects that's pretty remarkable because a lot of them are also at the same time tired and feeling challenged and at times overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And yet I think that combination of energy and love for their call but also being aware that we're living at a critical time where the church is struggling has led them to be more, um, more inventive, uh, willing to, to experiment more, a little more imaginative, and I think that's going to be the source of a lot of renewal. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, many times we're not, um, we're not forced to be imaginative or creative in, in, until we have to be. I think that's exactly right. We're a species that greatly prefers homeostasis, and will accommodate a lot of discomfort until we feel at a point of crisis and then know things have to change. And I think we're pretty close, if not already there, to that point where a lot of folks are saying we really need to rethink what we're doing if we're to have a future in North America. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it's the energy, it's the, the enthusiasm that's, as, as you put it, the love for their call that you're seeing. Um, are you seeing uh, at, at your seminary, is, is the average age of the person getting into this field uh, going up or down? at Luther? You're, you're at Luther Seminary, I should have mentioned that. Yep, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And for a generation, uh, the age of entering seminarians was creeping up. Yeah. More and more second career persons taking advantage of the chance to go to seminary. But over the last decade, that's really shifted, and we have a lot of students coming right out of college. Um, and so now there's a pretty healthy mix. A lot of students early in their careers, as well as some bringing experience from a number of different fields. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what, a, what, what is the church that there, I imagine most of these Lutheran pastors, uh, what, what is the church they're inheriting going to look like? And uh, which directions do you see them going in as these younger pastors take, uh, take charge? Well, we actually about a quarter of our students are from other traditions, oh, mostly, okay. mostly Protestant, um, but certainly a lot of Lutherans. And I think, I think the big challenge they're facing and that they know they're facing is that um, people don't just go to church anymore because their parents went to church. And I don't think the mainline tradition particularly realized how much we kind of counted on this subtle quiet support of the culture where everyone was, was just more or less expected to be at church. Mm -hmm. And today people have um, so many options on the one hand and also pressures. Uh, anything from work that goes 24-7 now to children who are in all kinds of activities that don't take a break on Sunday morning. And people don't just do things because they're supposed to do them. They really look for things that offer them meaning and a sense to make sense of their lives. And so you know, there's a generation of pastors that I think feels very discouraged um, because they look back at their parents' church or their grandparents' church and it seemed like everything was growing. And they wonder, uh, what have we done wrong? And I think the first thing to say is, it's, you haven't done anything wrong. This isn't your fault. The culture has dramatically changed, but we haven't changed with it. And so I think an emerging generation of students 
knows that. They're not so convinced that the practices we've that have served us so well for a century or more um, are sacrosanct. They're willing to call those into question, and I think that's absolutely critical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, I, I want to move now into really where your wheelhouse is, uh, David, and that is in preaching. And um, I, I guess I'd first like to ask you, uh, what uh, what are you seeing that's exciting about about t- about contemporary preaching? Yeah, I think if you had asked me that uh, even two years ago, I probably would have given a really different answer. Really? Um, yeah, I think in the last year or two, I've been part of a study group um, leading a research grant from the Lilly Endowment on vocation and calling. Mm-hmm. And um, we realized this this peculiar dichotomy between we're it's a partnership with four other seminaries, all different traditions. All of our graduates are committed to a theology of vocation, that all of God's people have a calling in daily life. But when you go a little deeper and reach into the congregations all of our graduates are serving, what you find is very few people believe that what they spend most of their time doing is a calling or worth God's attention or the church's attention. And, uh, and that felt like a dramatic shift. So we spent a year kind of probing the culture and came out with a conviction that people today are um, making meaning and constructing their identities in very different ways and that the preaching that I have done up to this point I think wasn't done with that in mind and so it's thrown me into what I call a uh, fruitful vocational crisis. (laughs) It's been very productive. Um, It's all about my vocation but it really has been a crisis. I don't think I know or I don't think I'm nearly as confident of what good preaching is or needs to be today as I was a year or two ago. I have some hunches and have been kind of working out some of those and doing some experimenting. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, I think we're best served now by being willing to listen and explore and experiment and not necessarily assume that what we've always done is what we need to keep doing. Don't get me wrong, it works for a lot of people, um, but the group for whom it works seems to be decreasing, and the group for whom it's not connecting seems to be growing. Huh. huh. Well, I, I really want you to kind of parse that for us here, because um, certainly uh, w- when we talk about preaching, I, I automatically think of in a liturgical context where uh, mm-hmm. people are, are, come, are, are coming and ready to hear um, an exposition on, on ancient texts that they value highly. Um, and our approach to that, you, you seem to be suggesting, is, 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 is undergoing some big changes. Yeah, I think, the, I think the dominant reality that shifted is that a generation ago, um, the Christian story or the biblical stories were part and parcel of everyday life. And uh, people knew them well enough to reference them and make sense of their lives in light of them. And that's just no longer true. It, for a lot of people who, even who go to church and love traditional church and would say their pastor's a good preacher, Sunday may be the only day of the week that they think at all about the biblical stories they've heard. Yeah. Um, it might be the only time they really think deeply about their faith. And in this kind of world where there are so many stories that were inundated with stories through the internet and television and radio and all of the rest, if the only time these stories are useful to you the only time you think about your faith and it feels useful to you is Sunday morning, yeah. then sooner or later you're going you're gonna to do some other things with your time. You're going to want that hour on Sunday to support the other 167 hours of the week. And so I think what we've, uh, what we've done is we've fallen into what I would call a performative mode of preaching hmm. where um, I'm the only one as the preacher. I'm up front doing all the talking. I'm the one interpreting the biblical texts. And I'm the one making connections between faith and life. And that worked when the culture was more or less or even superficially Christian and you were sort of surrounded, it was the water you swam in. Yeah. But today, I think we need our people to, to be able to master those skills themselves. That is, they need to be able to know these stories and interpret these stories. They need to be able to make connections between faith and life. So I think we need to move to a more participatory model of preaching and worship where on Sunday morning, we don't imagine it as a performance where I'm doing this tremendous exposition of scripture, but we imagine it as a, as a safe place where people can develop skills that are essential to leading their Christian lives in the world. Um, one of the things I, 
you know, I've discovered, or, or the way I put it, trying to be both a little humorous and, and serious, is that I think the average church leader leads an active fantasy life. <laughs> and it's a wholesome fantasy. Don't get too concerned. <laughs> right, right, right. But it goes like this, that people will come to church on Sunday and they will have such an inspired experience because of the worship and hopefully the preaching that they will leave church making all kinds of connections between the faith and their daily life and energized by those connections, they'll share their faith with others and over time invite them back to the congregation that's, that's been so wonderful. Um, and I think there's no church leader I know that wouldn't say, yeah, that's what I work for, hope for, pray for, prepare for, and I need to say, it's a fantasy because adults like us derive most of our identity from our areas of competence mm -hmm. from what we're good at mm -hmm. and being put in situations where we're not experienced or we don't know what we're doing really raises the anxiety for adult learners yeah. and so if our people aren't doing those things interpreting scriptures connecting faith and life sharing their faith in the relatively safe confines of church, what in the world makes us think they're going to be doing it out in the world? But, um, you know, these skills that what, what we were trained to do in seminary was perform certain religious skills. And the mark of competence was being able to do it really well. And I think we're at a point where, ironically, the better I am at the performative model of preaching, the deeper the crisis gets. Mm -hmm. Because the reaction of the typical parishioner is going to be, one of two things positively, wow, you are really good and we're so lucky you're our pastor. Or negatively, not that different, wow, you're really good. I don't think I could ever do anything like that. And so what I want to see is the mark of competence shifted from me being able to do these things well to my parishioners being able to do these things well, that, that as they leave church, they're more confident about their ability to connect the biblical stories and their life story making sense of faith in life and sharing their faith with others. Well, you know, you bring up so much with those comments, David, about, uh, you know, the, I mean, we're in such a consumeristic culture where we come, you know, we, we, well, I'll give you an example. I was planning a funeral yesterday with the folks who were not churched, and I said, well, would you like to sing any songs? And they looked at me like I had two heads. They said, yeah. who sings songs anymore? Um, we yeah. come to watch songs being performed. Uh, we, we, we tune in to, to, um, you know, to programs to watch these things being performed. There's not a sense that we would actually be a part of that. If, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, that, that, that you know, this is a real danger if people just come to look and think that we can emulate it, but we'll, we never do it. Yeah, and part of learning, obviously, is watching um, yeah. and internalizing norms and seeing what it looks like to do. But sooner or later, you've got to get in the game, or we have a generation of Christians who really are just spectators. Both of my kids uh, play violin. They're 12 and 14 now. They've been playing for eight and nine years, mm -hmm. respectively. And I've thought at times what it would be like now, a decade later, if every week for their lesson, half hour, hour, whatever it is, if they watched their uh, violin teacher play music, play the violin, and they would actually learn a lot. They would learn to appreciate great music. They would, they would be able to recognize good technique. Mm -hmm. They would know much of the canon of violin music, but they would not be able to play the violin. Yeah. And, um, and for me, this idea of, of modeling, of allowing people to watch and listen and enjoy, but also then meeting them where they are and giving them very small pieces that they can work on and master, which is of course the way a good coach or a good teacher, you don't start with uh, with this large Baroque piece of music, you start with them holding the violin correctly. Uh, and I think we need to think about preaching and worship in a similar way, that we certainly meet people where we are. We don't expect them to go from sitting back and listening to standing up in the pulpit and preaching. But can we begin to invite them uh, to take these stories with them out into the world and sort of charge them to go look for where they see these things? Mm -hmm. And over time, as they practice that, can we have them reflect back by email um, or other means what they see? And over time, can we invite them to talk with each other for short periods or moments? And can we expand that over time? Can we think about a variety of ways in which they can increase their capacity to participate. And so if you would jump into it, it would be very intimidating. But most people, I think, discover as they participate and develop some competence, 
and with that some confidence, they actually enjoy being a part of it. And when you think about the rest of their lives, increasingly our life is not one of passive, passively receiving things. We're in a participatory world. That's the big advent of Web 2.0. Yeah. We're no longer consumers of information. We're producers, whether we're writing a book on Amazon or putting a post on a blog or engaged in the kind of dialogue we are via the computer, people again and again are much more participants in life than audience. And yet in church they come and we have kind of a strong cultural ethos that they should sit back and only receive. And that's not true liturgically, the liturgy itself is a dialogue. But when it comes to interpreting scripture, sharing faith, most of that gets reserved for the leader, and I think that really needs to change. Well, and you know what you know what you're saying really you know can, kind of can set off a lot of different synapses in my mind, and and uh, one is that you know certainly the liturgy um, is meant to be participative. Liturgy work of mm -hmm. the people. I mean, certainly since the early days, there were you know ways in which everybody could get involved. A, have we lost that? And B, of course, the big question is, is how do we move more towards solving the problem, the challenge that you, you put before us? Yeah, the liturgy is participatory, but it's become for a lot of people a script that they read um, rather yeah. than an event that they're participating in. Yeah, you, you know, you, it, that's, that's, that's so true. And you wonder how we begin to give that work back. Yeah, and I think that's where the sermon becomes an interesting place because it's the one unscripted part. I mean, a lot of preachers are using manuscripts, but yeah. but in terms of the hearer, they don't know what's coming. Um, and I think finally, um, I think we practice the things we value and we want to get good at. And to give you an example of what we're really good at, uh, it's the simple formula. If I say, the Lord be with you, you say. Mm -hmm. And also with you. Right, we know that. You don't need a script, you don't need it written down. You have that mastered, and our people do, because they've practiced it. Right. So they know that, they know the Lord's Prayer, they know how to sit quietly for 15 minutes while I do the talking. What they don't know is uh, how to connect the Bible to their life, um, how to share their faith. And so can we, can we create some space in the midst of that to encourage them to practice, and as they practice, will the rest of the worship service itself become more meaningful because it's no longer a set piece. It's something that they are actually owning and um, connecting with and seeing the relevance to. So we need to start small, there's no question about it, but I think we need to move in the direction of seeing Sunday worship as this rehearsal space, this God-given rehearsal space to practice and develop confidence in the skills that are essential to living as a Christian in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, give me a, take me a bit farther, David, if you could. Give me some examples of, uh, of, of ways, perhaps, that you've seen this attempted uh, or put into play. Sure. I read a weekly column uh, for Working Preacher called Dear Working Preacher, and it's yeah. kind of a... It's like my sermon for preachers. Yeah, it's um, wonderful. I, I, I try to read that as often as I can. Thank oh, you thanks. For it. Yeah, and it's kind of... It's kind of a middle place. It's not commentary. It's not sermon, but it, it's moving in that direction. And about a year ago, I started experimenting with some ideas and inviting um, readers to experiment also. And the level of comments and readership um, just grew exponentially. So I think it kind of touched a nerve. And the emails I get back, I'll describe some of those experiments in a second, but the emails I get back almost always begin in the same way. I didn't think this would work. But, you know, so it's new, and new is scary because we don't feel confident yet. Um, but it's had a lot of great results. So here are some of the, here are some of the things we did. In uh, one of the Luke parables about money, um, I said, hey, it's stewardship season. Why don't we preach a sermon about stewardship that doesn't ask anyone for money? In fact, the kind of heart of the parable was about trust. I think it was the farmer who built the large barns. And... The exegetical insight was simply his problem isn't that he's planning for the future, it's that he shows no trust in God or no regard for people outside himself. So guess what? On all of our money it says, in God we trust. Do you think we mean that? What if we gave everyone a dollar this week instead of asking them for money and sent them out into the world asking that when they spend that dollar and their other dollars, they reflect on whether or not the way they spend reflects trust in God. Um, and people were kind of amazed that people did it and it kept them thinking about their faith and thinking about their spending. So that was one. Um, in last spring, winter, spring, when we had that long period on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Yeah, yeah. In Epiphany. Never ending. Yeah. Yeah, seven weeks. 
<laughs> um, we did a few experiments. One was, uh, you know, the, the amazing thing is all of these, the exegetical insights are not phenomenal. <laughs> They're really basic. And the experiments are not wildly creative. They're just different. <laughs> and so um, the week of the Beatitudes, the insight, very simple, was, gosh, Jesus blesses all kinds of people that don't normally get blessing. Maybe we ought to do the same and have individual blessing this Sunday. Have people come up and be blessed as they come to communion or the way out of the church or whatever. And the response was phenomenal. Um, one pastor wrote and said, you know, we worship about 400. And after the service, six people wanted to join and two asked to be baptized. Not a, nobody had a dry eye. And so we kind of talked about this is so simple. Why is it having such an impact? And we concluded that that blessing is incredibly uncommon in our world. You know, we're good at affirming. My kids have more medals and trophies for participation. <laughs> you know, like when I was little, you had to win. <laughs> you right, know? right, 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 right. You, like, hey, there was only one valedictorian. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now you just show up. Right, right. So we affirm and we accuse, right? This is our political environment. Yeah. But we don't bless. And that's a powerful thing for the church to do. And so how did the church do this practically, David? Um, you know, I made a couple suggestions. They did it in, in different ways. A lot of them, if they did not have communion at the time, they might have had people come up and receive an individual blessing. Others concluded the service with people turning and blessing each other. Okay. Um, and that's been one of the fun things, too. People really kind of adopted and run. So another week, it was it was uh, Sermon on the Mount also, and it was that line, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Yeah. And I always find that to be an incredibly intimidating passage. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and I was reading Eugene messages the Peterson, uh, uh, Eugene Peterson's the message, right. and Eugene translates it as um, "Be the person God intended you to be, just as God is who God is supposed to be." And I thought, wow. And then I thought, better check this. Eugene's a little loose sometimes with right. the Greek. The verb there is "tell us." That's exactly what it means. Not moral perfection, but reach the end you were intended to do. And so that Sunday I suggested handing out paper and pencils and having people write one thing in their life that's keeping them from being the person God wants them to be. And then pass it in with the offering or throw it out or have a place to put it. And churches just got very creative. One group had everyone pass it in and they lit them on fire and people watched what was inhibiting them from being the, the persons God wanted them to be burn up. Another uh, passed out little pieces of water-soluble paper, and they wrote it down, and then on the way out, dropped it in the baptismal font and watched it dissolve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think this is the thing that it invites. It's, a, it's just a little nudge, and then pastors can think about their context and their people and own it and be very creative. And the response across the board from pastors is, the thing about the sermon was it wasn't, like a great sermon in the way we think of a great performative sermon, but people kept talking about it. They kept thinking about it. And, and that's the idea. Not that they even are thinking about the sermon, but they're thinking about that experience and they're thinking about that passage in relation to their life. And I think that's, that's the kind of experimenting I'm interested in doing. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, what you're saying, you know, the cynic in me, um, David says, oh, that sounds gimmicky. <laughs> You know, that's exactly what I always think. Yeah. <laughs> and five years ago, I would have been, I would have totally, you know, bashed my own efforts. Right. <laughs> and, and now I'm thinking, okay, gimmicky is when you're trying to get attention. Well, uh, or you're trying to do a bait and switch. Yeah, right, right. It's something that, that what you're after is kind of a manipulative experience where you've, you've you know, you've done something for the, the sheer experience or the attention. Yeah. Now I call it creative. <laughs> right, so I've become more generous <laughs> right. um, because the idea in the end, and, and this is the amazing thing, at the end of a great performative sermon, mm -hmm. people says, wow, what a great preacher. At the end of using one of these gimmicks or little creative exercises, people say, wow, that's interesting. It makes me think about my life differently. Or, so or, they, say, what a, or they say, what a great God. Or what a great God. Or you have helped me see God in my life better. You know, and I think that's what it's about. When it's done, in a sense, the preacher ought to be fading into the background. And what ought to be left is this person and their God and this world where that, they now can imagine themselves seeing and partnering with God in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, you're you're so right, and I mean, I would, I as a as a regular preacher myself, I, I would not be honest to say that there isn't some ego, um, you know, uh, boosting that goes on in this, and you look forward to being the spotlight and et cetera, et cetera. To some degree, even the shyest among us, if they're going to be honest, but to really try to, because that's what we, hopefully that's what we try to do as a work of the people is to put the spotlight on God, and mm-hmm. and realizing that. Perhaps the sermon um, doesn't always have to be God shining through me, uh, but it, it, it's, it's got to be God shining through whatever. Yeah, I think the dominant model for a lot of clergy in the last generation or two, professional model, has been, or the comparison has been, clergy are like doctors and lawyers, where we're the professional guild. And I love doctors and lawyers. This isn't about them at all. Right. <laughs> but I think, you know, you go to a doctor and a lawyer when you're sick or in trouble. And particularly when you know you don't know enough to help yourself, you go to an expert. And I think that today is a devastating model, that we become the religious experts or the purveyors of spiritual goods. And so what I would like us to think about ourselves is more like a coach who can take any five players on the basketball court and make them better, or a conductor who is the only one on stage who's quiet but if he or she is doing his job, the whole orchestra plays better. Um, or this one was suggested by um, the Episcopal Bishop of the, uh, of the diocese in Chicago. He said he likes to think about his role as a, as a priest as like Julia Childs, which I just love. Because she really, if you saw the Julia and Julia movie, she worked very hard to learn something that was so mysterious and seemed so difficult. And as soon as she had learned it, she thought... If I can do this, others can. Yeah. And spent kind of the rest of her life in this kind of good-spirited mm-hmm. uh, teaching of, of a whole generation of how to cook. Right, right, right. And that's, you still have a very important role, but in the end, the mark of competence isn't that you're great at it, but a whole lot of other people are. And I just think that's a really intriguing model mm-hmm. uh, and very satisfying model to play with. Yeah, and I mean, Julia Child, for, for all that she, she was talented, um, her talent was really in the teaching more than it was perhaps in the cooking. I don't, I've never tasted her food, but I've seen some of those things with gelatin that I don't know if I'd want to try. <laughs> well, and she made all kinds of mistakes along the way and was able to laugh about it, yeah. which, which does what? It allows the people watching to think, huh, if I make mistakes, it's okay. Right. And uh, if you're going to take risks, you have got to be ready to fail. And I think that's kind of where we're at, that this kind of reclaiming an age of innovation and experimentation, which means some failure, in order to find a way not just to nurture the people who are still coming, Mm -hmm. but to imagine that there are a whole lot of people with similar questions that haven't found a place where they connect yet. Yeah, and getting back to that uh, image you offered earlier about uh, living in kind of this fantasy world, um, we, we, it's harder to do now because you and I are, t- are talking. My, my flock can, can, will see this post. Um, my, they read what I, I'm going to read. I mean, our lives are more transparent with social media mm-hmm. and this kind of thing that you really can't hide uh, very, you know, very easily anymore. I mean, what you see is what you get to a greater degree. Mm-hmm. And I think people, because they're living in this world, um, saturated 24-7 with data and information, Mm -hmm. what they don't really crave is more information, which I think was the way we thought about preaching and and the Bible, that I was to open up this book of information so you'd know more stuff. Um, What they crave is an experience. They crave uh, a connection to God and each other and the world. Mm -hmm. And they can't do that. They can't get that just by listening to me. They can be inspired, but they need to learn some of these skills themselves. And and it's not just an experience, David, is it? It's an experience with God. I mean, it's God touching people. Absolutely. Yeah, that, 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 that I think when we look at Scripture, what we have there is a collection of confessions of past sightings of God. Mm-hmm. People who have seen God and experienced God and had to tell. And one of the really relevant dynamics or elements of reading the Bible that we've overlooked is that these provide models, um, the patterns of what it's like to see and experience God. Because finally, you and I will probably never lead our flock to the river and part the waters and walk across. <laughs> you know? But we might be caught up in a situation of, of a hurricane or flooding devastating water and the churches come together and find a way through. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not the same, but knowing the one pattern, the one story, helps you see God in the other. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that's our task, is to open these stories so that people learn how to look for God and partner with God and experience God, not just on Sunday at the God Box, but that Sunday prepares them to do that well the whole week long. And if that's the case, then there's a reason to come back to church. Church helps me make sense of my life. Church helps me see and experience God. If church is the only place I, I expect to see God, then it doesn't last. It doesn't hold. And I'm going to find other things that help me more make sense of my life in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I want to ask you a few questions about how we, what we do this, David. Um, you know, how, how do you, what, what, what should I be bringing to, um, to the study table then on Tuesday morning when I sit down with the texts and think about, well, um, you know, it's coming up on Sunday. Uh, how do I offer people more than just my profound, profound insights? Mm -hmm. Well, some of the preparation is the same. It, it still is important and helpful to search the scriptures, to wrestle with the word, to, to listen for how this word touches you. How are you experiencing it is a very important place to start. Um, it's not just what do you understand, but what do you feel? Yeah. But then two other things. One, um, get out of your church and visit people in their daily lives, at work and at home and where they volunteer in the schools, and talk with them about the challenges and opportunities where they see God, where they wish they saw God. Mm -hmm. That will transform the ministry of any preacher because you're in touch with um, your people's life in a way you're not. But then the other thing is to think about, okay, when I'm done this sermon, what we tend to think of is what do I want to do, right? What do I want to offer? What do I want our people to have done? Um, where do I want our people to have grown? How do I want to set them up for a week of living their faith in the world? Mm -hmm. And that's a question we haven't typically been invited to ask as we're preparing our sermons, but I think it's a crucial one. No, these, this, this is some great. Uh, these are some great questions to ask as we sit down and as as we study. Um, this is really what uh, is at the root of the word minister is to is to to really kind of meet um, where where folk are coming, you know, to 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 be equipped. Uh, I mean, certainly we come for worship, so we come to give thanks and we come to offer what we offer. But we also do uh, seem to come because we want to um, find out where this intersection of our life and God seem to seem to be. That's right, and I think we spend so much time worrying about how to get people to church or how to give or educating them about the importance of stewardship. And, you know, I think 90% of it's a waste of time <laughs> because um, th what's changed is people don't automatically give to the church, but they still give. They give to those institutions that make a difference in their lives. And so whether it's their kids' orchestra or sporting team or... Um, a group that's become important to them or a charity they've become involved in and not just watching but they're participating they're volunteering and so if we can imagine that church is meant to help people live their lives fully and productively and in partnership with God as that works as people get that they come and they give because it makes a difference to them mm -hmm. Um, are, are, are you in danger of crossing that kind of line that we all fear, David, about being, making churches uh, consumeristic? Well, I think they already are. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned that earlier. People come and they sit back waiting to see what you're going to do. Um, I'm actually, I want to see them um, more as vocational counseling centers where they come to have their own sense of calling clarified. They come to hear that they are a child of God and to be equipped to live that life in the world. And I think that ends up being far less consumeristic. I mean, this isn't about simply pandering to what people want. Yeah. This is about thinking deeply about how the gospel can still transform lives. And in the end, finally, if they're participating, not just at worship, worship is the practice ground for everyday life. If they leave feeling like their church is equipping them and they come back because they want to join in that work of the people, then I think we've sort of transcended consumerism and entered into fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, which has a profound uh, biblical history as, as finally we are gathered as kindred in the spirit to encourage and comfort and instruct each other why? So we can go out as the body of Christ into the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned a generation ago, David, that you saw the uh 
the age of your seminarians at a different place than it is today. Uh, certainly the age of seminarians has changed as well as our congregations. Are you uh, suggesting and cultivating uh, different uh, skills that are needed today to uh, build healthy congregations? And if so, what are those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it used to be that to, to be a pastor at a church was to sort of be at the church. Uh, you would go visit people in the hospital. Uh, that was the major kind of outing you would make. But most of what happened revolved around the church. And um, we need to kind of reverse that flow or that gravitational pull. I always get these confused, but centripetal and centrifugal, you know, one, the force goes inward. The other, it comes outward. It's the one when you're on the amusement park ride and it's spinning around and you're up against the wall. You're right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know, we've had this gravitational pull toward the church, and we need to reverse that to more of ascending outward. Or actually, we need both. We need people to come in order to be equipped to be sent back outward. But the pastor, as leader, has to model that. And so the pastor, clearly you can find the pastor at her church, but she also needs to be out and about visiting people in, in their vocational venues, um, leading them in volunteering and advocacy. And, and that's a different skill set. So we were, I think, set up for more. We, we didn't think of it at the time. Nobody intended it this way, but we were set up to be chaplains of the resident chaplain of a congregation. And now we need to be missionaries. We need to be um, missionaries and coaches. That is, we can't, we, the pastor can't be the missionary. The pastor needs to be the missionary trainer, in a sense, mm -hmm. equipping people to go out. But a part of that is, of course, yourself going out. And, and, and it's because we're really uh, in a different era now, aren't we? I mean, you know, the, the, um, the Christian faith isn't, um, you know, uh, really uh, bolstered by what we're hearing out in the world, whereas in previous generations, perhaps, when churches were closed on Sunday and when there was a general understanding of prayer being more roundly uh, accepted, if not even um, beyond that in the general culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't think we realized how much we came to depend upon the support of the culture. It's, it's not, uh, you know, historically it's not accurate to call America a Christian nation. Right. Nevertheless, no religions had more of an influence. Right. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and I don't think we realized how much we benefited from the fact that our children were learning the Christian story in school, uh, around the holidays and the pageants, or the number of, of uh, televised programs, Andy Williams' Christmas program, and how many people learned the songs of the faith yeah. there as well as church. Yeah. That's all gone. And I say that not to pine for a nostalgic past right. or to stir up culture wars. I don't think the God we know and Jesus on the cross would want us to force our faith on people through the culture. Mm -hmm. But it's simply to recognize the world's changed dramatically. It's, it's, Christianity is one story among many. And I don't even mean religious stories. There are consumer stories and national stories and all kinds of other stories through which people can make meaning. Mm -hmm. And we need to be advocates for our story. Most people that leave mainline churches, mainline leaders have this sort of sense that people leave a church, it's, it's to go to the evangelical church down the street. And it's like, you know what? No. When most, the overwhelming percentage of people who leave mainline churches don't go anywhere else. They just don't come back because the faith hasn't been helpful to them in making sense of their lives. And so they give their time, energy, money to the institutions that are helping them. And so I think, you know, we don't live in the, in the age of obligation anymore where people do things because they should. We live in the age of discretion where people think, I've got like a thousand things coming at me. I need to be discreet. I need to exercise discretion and choose the things that are going to be most meaningful and worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so, so really what you're suggesting is that the skills of, of today's um, uh, pastors need to be one of, of getting out. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, meeting people. Um, it, 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 you seem to describe we also need to be inventive, uh, not afraid to try new things, which is certainly what you're suggesting in your uh, in your sermon uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but 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 go ahead. Well, and I think we really need to think of ourselves as those who are training Christians to live their lives in the world, mm -hmm. and to be focusing again and again on. The, uh, what are the skills that we learned in seminary? Um, what are the skills that have helped us make sense of our lives in the faith? How can I teach them, share them, spread them, yeah. instead of imagining I'm the one who's to perform them? Yeah. 
And, and that above all else, that every element of your leadership in a congregation needs to be focused around. When people leave, what will they be able to do better? What will be they be able to name or experience more fully? Um, yeah, it's a challenging, challenging task. And, and we're served, you know, we're not served by thinking the problem is we need to do what we've always done better. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are burning out trying to do it better and working inordinate hours trying to make the old pattern work. We need to sort of recognize it's not working, that we need to ask a different question. And we may not even know what question to ask yet, mm -hmm. but sometimes it helps to admit what you don't know because then you're open to learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so uh, when, when you and I kind of survey the landscape, David, of, of, of many churches that are very challenged at this time uh, in, in terms of just, just survival, um, your advice seems to be one of, 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 of thinking of yourself more as an equipper. Yeah, very much so. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll give that pitch, and yeah. someone will come up and say, you mean I'm just a teacher? I'm just a coach? And I'll say, yeah. <laughs> Have you had a good teacher? Have you had a good coach? Yeah. Do you remember how phenomenally talented they were? How hard they worked? Yeah. What a profound expression of leadership that was? How much they affected your life? How much they affected your life. And then it clicks. Like somehow we've thought, okay, if we're not doctors and lawyers, then we're only teachers. And we don't mean that as a slap to the people who educate our children, you know, but it is. And then when you ask them to reflect back on the very meaningful people in their lives, guess what? It's coaches and teachers. It's not often doctors and lawyers. Right. And when they think about it, when they get over the kind of cultural stereotype or the concern of about a loss of cultural prestige, which yeah. is at a very unconscious level a lot of what this is about, then they realize that that's a phenomenal exercise of leadership that touches an incredible amount of people, and then they're halfway there. Okay, okay. So, so David, through your work at workingpreacher.org and, and certainly your other writings and that kind of thing, you, you then become the preacher's coach. Uh, and so, and so yeah. you, you know, in, in some ways, and so, yeah. so your yeah. idea is for us to kind of emulate the coaching that you do, uh, I, I, as any good coach would do, and that has to do with, I'm sure, the resources uh, and resourcing people. Um, I, I've always found it interesting, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, that, that, that sometimes preachers don't really want to give out their sources or don't really <laughs> want to share. And, and I mean, that's, that's you know, and this is what we should be doing, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I, I started a, a website, a blog, not long ago, and I know what you mean because I'm like, if I just tell people the great websites I go to, exactly, come to mine, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and I think you know, and then I slap myself, <laughs> you know, like, get over yourself, right, right, right. No, I think I think I think that's a natural human fear, right? But I think what this world rewards now, particularly in when we're in a social media environment and, and unaided by websites and information, I think the world rewards generosity. Yeah. And the more you give away, I think the more people look to you uh, because they've received so much already and they see you as a resource. Uh, and if I have to choose between being seen as an expert and seen as a resource, my more sinful self will choose expert. <laughs> I, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, but my more Christian self or my more uh, dedicated self, my disciple self, will want to be a resource. And actually, I found that I think in the environment we're in, experts are becoming less and less valuable and um, trusted resources are going up exponentially in value. And so I think, I think there's a lot to be learned by this phenomena in the web where we ourselves go back to sites that share inordinately with us and why not adopt a similar model and this model of generosity and giving away and um, emptying yourself you know there's a precedent for that <laughs> right, right, right. yeah you know I, and you, you bring up such I mean this point is just you know it is so popular right now with these these arguments between you know San Francisco and 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 Hollywood about giving away information versus charging for it and and uh, look at what YouTube that's free and Wikipedia mm -hmm. that's free and and all of these sites where we can just find these uh, overwhelming uh, you know. Uh, 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 you know, portals and places of, of uh, almost unfathomable information, um, and they find a way to monetize. I mean, they're you know, 
That's absolutely right. And both those examples are great because they're both free. Yeah. They both have generated enough allegiance that people support them. And both of them invite what? Your participation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Finally, you make YouTube work by putting the, the okay. videos up. And in Wikipedia, to compare that to Encarta, which was Microsoft's computer-based encyclopedia, where they had the best designers and researchers and you know, I think what makes Wikipedia work, and Carter's not even around anymore, what makes Wikipedia work is you have thousands upon thousands of people who are invested. They have participated, and you've not only given them something, but you've invited them to give something back yeah. to the world. Mm -hmm. And there are a few things more motivated, motivating than being allowed to make a, part, a contribution that matters. And so, again, a lot to learn from this environment we're in about how to be church in the world. Right, right. Well, listen, uh, some great words to leave off on, but uh, David, I always like to make room at the end for uh, any comments or observations you might have. Coming into the interview, you may have thought, well, I want to get across this point or that point. Maybe you started saying something I didn't let you finish. Uh, so I'd like to, to leave it now to you for some, uh, uh, some, some, some wrap-up points. Um, <laughs> the one thing I wasn't prepared for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I think we covered a lot of the ground. I mean, I think... The new, I just, it was just a couple weeks ago I started a website uh, in the meantime and I put this in an email and I couldn't get that URL so I had to use my name which <clears throat> for a kid from Pennsylvania is like mortifying to <laughs> use for your a name Lutheran your from address. Pennsylvania. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> but it, for me it's an experiment to certainly engage clergy but what I'm way more interested in is can we engage the everyday Christian in um, helping them think about their faith in relation to parenting and politics and money and whatever. So I think that that impulse is what I'm interested in now. It's it's when people talk about working preacher, which is getting, you know, three hundred and fifty thousand hits a month now, it's really done very well. I always say, you know what, that was the low hanging fruit. Like I'm just amazed nobody else thought of it earlier. because <laughs> um, preachers need sermons. But our everyday Christian, and I, I'm a little suspicious of layperson now because what it means in the popular imagination is, is amateur, you know. Um, the everyday Christian doesn't necessarily know they need help in thinking about their faith. They haven't done it for so long. <laughs> and so I'm just really curious about how we can kindle conversations with our people about how these phenomenal stories um, can shape their story and how what happens on Sunday ought to prepare them to experience God in the world every day. So, uh, so that's where more and more my energy is going and, and, um, and any way we can get that word out, I'm, I'm happy to help. Yeah, yeah. well, um, David Lowe's from Luther Seminary and workingpreacher.org, thanks for joining me on Church Next. You're very welcome, Chris. Thank you for the invitation.